and uh, nice of you to join me again. And today I'm going to be talking about printing. Now apparently one of the UK's leading photographic chains, Jessops, conducted a survey which found that 20% of British adults had never ever had a photo printed. And only 8% of British adults printed photos once a month. Now I think that partly reflects a generational change with m people more likely to use their phones to make photos, to look at them and to share them. But you'd think dyed-in-the-wool photo enthusiasts who have invested a lot of time and money into their hobby would want to print pictures. Now I think that a lot of people are put off from printing photographs by the information that's available on social media put out by so-called experts. Listening to these guys, and they always seem to be men, let's face it, you need a full frame sensor, 20 stops of dynamic range, 20 bit raw capture, a megapixel count of at least 100, and you need to print on paper made from the hair of Vestal Virgins by German dwarfs that has an archival rating of at least 1,000 years. The surprising thing that I've found is that when you start looking at pictures, photographic prints I'm talking about, up to 29 by 42 centimetres, which is A3, is that it's very hard to see any difference between images from a 12 megapixel full frame camera, a 16 megapixel micro four thirds image, an 18 megapixel APS-C, or a 42 megapixel full frame sensor. I'll back that up in a minute and show you some examples. Now when you go to print larger, that is when you do see the deficits, both in terms of equipment and your technique, to be perfectly honest. But it is possible, and I have done this, to take an image from the original Canon 5D, which had 12.7 megapixels, I think, if I remember quite correctly, and print it at a size of 100 by 150 centimetres and get a very, very satisfactory result. Let's look at some examples to see what I'm talking about making prints from different sized sensors and different megapixel counts. This first picture was taken on the Micro Four Thirds camera, the Olympus EM1 Mark II, with the Leica 100 to 400 millimeter lens. And this was taken in quite low light, and we can see that the um, picture isn't overly affected by any high noise. There's still detail in the feathers here and in the bark and even the scales on the leg of the bird here. So that's quite a nice print again at A3 sized. If we compare it to this next picture this one was taken using a Canon EOS 6D with a Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter lens. Again, in quite low light, although you can't tell that from the picture. And we look here and there's plenty of feather detail. Um, there's no obtrusive grain and it's it made another very nice print. This next picture was taken using a Sony A7R2 and the Sigma 150 to 600. Again, in fairly low light. And now we're starting to see a little bit of a difference, but not that much. There's a bit more detail in the feathers 
and in the eye. But the difference between this one and this one isn't particularly huge. And not particularly huge here. There's not a lot of difference when looking at a normal viewing distance. I'm sure that if you took these pictures and looked at them under a, a magnifying glass, you'd be able to find little differences and discrepancies. But from a normal viewing distance, there isn't a lot of difference between the 20 megapixel micro four thirds um, image and the Sony a7R2 with its 42 megapixels on a full frame. Now this was all in low light, available light. The next pictures we're going to look at were taken at base ISO using flash. And this one was taken with the EM1 Mark II with a 60mm macro lens and again standing at normal viewing distance we can see there's lots of fine detail in the flower there's nice roll off in the tonal changes in the print and uh, yeah it's printed up nicely to uh, this A3 size This one was taken using the Canon 6D and the Canon EF100 Macro L. And again, nice detail in the flowers, nice texture, nice roll off in all the tonal gradations. Again, base ISO, no noise to talk about, and it's printed a nice picture. And lastly, we have from the uh, Sony A7R Mark II with a 105mm macro lens, and it's the same story. Base ISO, using flash, nice detail, nice tonal roll-offs, no noise. It's printed up beautifully at A3. And there is no difference in looking at any of them at normal viewing sizes. So what I'm saying basically is that any digital camera with a four-thirds sensor or larger from the last 15 years is perfectly capable of producing beautiful prints the equal of any of Sony's, Canon's or Nikon's latest super cameras. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, as the old saying goes. So at the picture taking stage, we'll need to ensure that you're getting the best out of your camera. With good technique, nice, sharp, well exposed photos are the key here. When I was teaching photography at art school, the most often heard comment from students was, I'll fix it in Photoshop. But as you boost the exposure or lift the shadows in your editing software, you introduce noise and colour casts and basically crap in equals crap out. Get it right in camera and you'll have a lot easier time. Okay, so now we've taken our picture, we get the image onto the computer and we edit it to taste. But we need to be aware that we don't want to lose any information by blocking up the shadows or blowing out highlights. Now this should be relatively straightforward as we've got a good exposure already. It's just about making um, slight changes to bring out the emphasis on the picture. So how do we prepare a picture for printing? Well, just as your camera has its dynamic range, 
So does your computer screen, and so does your printing paper and printer. So you've taken a photo of a scene where you have reduced the subject brightness range to fit in with your camera's dynamic range. Opening up on your computer screen, the screen has a greater range and as it is backlit. So you can see loads and loads of information in the shadows and the highlights can be quite hot at worst or be bright and detailed at best. Now most people prefer this look that is lots of contrast and bright colours and it's one of the reasons why a lot of people actually don't print it's because they feel their pictures don't look right when they're on the paper. So to get the image so it looks right on paper we have to match it to the dynamic range of the printer and paper. And now this is where colour calibration comes into play. We need to have the image on the screen at a known value. When I take an image I shoot in RAW as a means of preserving all the possible information. I calibrate my screen monthly with a little device called an X-Rite Color Monkey which I believe is sadly no longer on the market but there are other equivalents that are freely available from good photography shops. And I have it set automatically to react to changes in the ambient lighting in the room I do my processing. In my light room, so to speak. When I convert the raw file, it is to an uncompressed 16-bit TIFF in Profoto RGB. I know this all sounds very frightening and all this sort of thing, but it's not. And to do it like this ensures that there is as much colour information as possible so that I know that the image I got right in my camera is now right on my computer screen. Now we come to the printing side. And you can choose to do this yourself on a home printer, as I do, or you can send it out to a lab. There are pros and cons to each. With a lab, somebody else messes around with the printer and you just pay for the print. But the whole process from editing to test print to final print is a lot slower. Owning your own printer means that you have to outlay money up front for printer, ink and paper. And then you manage all the colour profiling yourself. But the whole process is quicker and the feedback is immediate. But either way, there is something you need, and that is the ICC profile of the printer and paper you are going to use. If you use a good lab, they should be able to supply the profile for you. If you go in the DIY route, then go to the website of the paper manufacturer and download the profile of the paper and the printer you are using. The Ultra Keen can do their own test strips and profile their own printer, but I choose to use the canned profiles, which I find perfectly good enough. I've, I've done the other, because I don't want the faff of creating a new profile every time I change ink or get a new box of paper. Once you've got the profile from the makers, just follow the makers instructions on the installation of it. We're going to revisit dynamic range again. Your printer and paper have a dynamic range that is much smaller of your camera and computer screen. So the trick is to literally squash all that image information so that it fits within the range of the printer and paper. One of the key tools to this, I found, is using the soft proofing feature 
of Photoshop or Lightroom. Now, I, I'm not too sure on other editing packages, um, but I'm, I, I would say that most of them should have this. To use the soft proof thing feature, you need to make sure that the profile you've just downloaded is selected, and then you activate it. Immediately, you will see your beautiful image looks muddy and lacks contrast. In fact, quite often it looks horrid. Relax. It only looks horrid because that's how the screen is interpreting what the profile for the paper and printer thinks of your picture. Now is the time to dip your toe in the printing water by doing a test print. I make um, postcard sized or 6x4s or 10x15 test prints because it's cheaper. And uh, if you're going to go the photo lab route then things get a bit protracted because you send out the picture, the image, file in the format they prefer and then wait for the lab to send you the picture back and then you evaluate it. Home printers can now feel smug at this stage because all you have to do is wait for the printer to finish in a matter of seconds. Look at the print under daylight or an artificial light source that's balanced for daylight or 56,000 Kelvin. Is it too dark? Too light? Too much contrast? Too little contrast? Are the colours how you saw them? Make the necessary changes and test print again. Repeat as many times needed until you have got things to your satisfaction. Then print your final print. Once the printer is finished with it, leave that print somewhere clean and flat and let it dry out thoroughly before you put in it in a frame or an album. I'm a great advocate of putting prints up on the wall and living with them. First because of their artistic or aesthetic value and second because there's nothing like looking at a print day in day out to make you think how a photo works. Is the composition good? Is the sharpness good? Are the colours right? Etc etc. This will spur you on to advance your photographic skills. Not all the photos you print and display need to be works of art. The other day my partner and I were sitting around talking about when she lived in Stoke Newington in North East London and consequently out came the shoebox of photos and it was great looking through them and talking about them. And I'd encourage you just to make prints for this reason alone. So, give printing a go. Don't be put off by what people say on the internet. It's not as daunting and as difficult as people make out. You don't need the latest equipment. You don't need a fancy computer. You just need a bit of time and a willingness to work on some skills. You'll have a tangible result to show for all the hours and money spent on photography. It will improve your photography no end because you'll improve your picture taking skills and your processing skills. And the benefit is you'll end up with some nice wall art and something to share with others at the end of it. Well thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you'll join me in the next one. Goodbye.